Marsha is going to be talking about identity, orientation, and atheism, natural allies, perfect partners. And thank you. Forgive me for butchering your name. What a powerful speech that last one was. I can hardly come up to it. I have to calm down. Goodness sakes. I thank the organizers of this fine, fine conference indeed. Oh my goodness sakes, it's been a joy so far. I also want to thank that valiant, ethical, just atheist who found my fountain pen yesterday and turned it in. Thank you very much. <laughs> goodness sakes. But most of all, I thank you. Because you, you and I together, are the ones who are going to take all our thoughts and our hopes into the world. It is a very long time since late in the 1970s when one day I walked down a street and I visited a little newsstand at Seattle's Pike Place Market, looking through those items on the shelf, and suddenly, oh my God, my, <laughs> literally, my heart. Because there on the shelf, second shelf down, was a copy of the American Atheist magazine. Goodness sakes, goodness sakes, I'd had my own battle with religion, and I could no longer accept the pain and the ordered mayhem of religion. But for the first time, pre-internet, you know, in my hands was a document of education and honor and hope. I bought it instantly. And at, uh, there was a time even further back than that, further back than that magazine moment. In 1968, another event occurred. Oh, the way of the world, I tell you. I'd left a good union job where I had learned the power of people uniting together, but I'd left that job to go to Paris for the revolution. Oh, you recall, May of 68, when workers and students and citizens and everyone gathered together and they almost changed a nation. Oh, after that great lesson and that tumult, I traveled, auto stop, hitchhike around Europe. And one evening, sitting with fellow travelers, if you will, near one of the columns in Venice's San Marco Square, it was the column with the lion, and the casual talk that night, during that talk, I became aware of someone speaking. Someone was saying they knew someone who knew someone who had a cousin, they think, who'd made a gender transition. Oh, my heart. <laughs> These two events, that magazine moment and the Venice moment, they set me on my course because both of those events proclaimed powerful truths. I was not the only one. I was not the only one. There were others that felt as I did, and equally stunning. There was something, some way, to do something about it. Oh, my goodness sakes. Both these things, ways to freedom of the mind and freedom of the self. These were moments in a long struggle that led on to the founding of Ingersoll Gender Center in Seattle, in the late 1970s, oh, I'm so proud of Ingersoll. We're still going strong. It's a center that deals with gender and identity. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. We do support groups. We got the longest running transgender support group in the country, as far as I know. I got 35 years of it. Oh, yeah. Well, we do um, a lot of other things. We have a prison uh, program. We have an employment program. We have a consult group for therapists and physicians with over 100 members in it. OK, OK, got to move on here. Back to the business. I was saying back then, started Ingersoll, but many other things were going on. Went back to school for a psychology degree. Made my own gender transition. And because of all these things, directly took into my public and personal life the atheist viewpoint. And these things have been part of me through everything. Everything that's followed, all the local and the national and the international leaderships and projects, the policy work, the politics, all of it. But nothing came quickly. No, no. That is certainly true. By 1991, I was fully and wholly a part of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender movement. 
fully and wholly at work in the fields of transgender, yet still, it was only then, in 1991, that I ventured to attend an American Atheist Conference, meeting Madeline, Dr. Zindler, and many others. And at that meeting, to realize the similarities of our projects, LGBT and atheists, but not the ways that these programs might beneficially unify. Since then, the LGBT movement has fought many battles and won many struggles. Oh yes, we've learned and we've taught a powerful and lasting message. We are equal. We are just. There is no sickness, no evil, no sin, no wrong in who we are and who we love. Yes. All the science of our time agrees now. The Medical Association, American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and so many others worldwide. We've come into the light and the full discussion and the full struggle. We have won so much and there is so much more to do, but we will, we will. Here we are in the heart of the heart of the Mormon world. This church, through all its mighty power and vast wealth into defeating marriage equality, they can never say that they're inclusive or it was someone else. They did it. They had so much more than our resources, yet after loss and renewal, we won. Not in all places, no, not yet, but in the places that matter most in the minds of serious and caring individuals across this country, and thanks especially to all of those, all those of you who are here, who have fought and continue to fight in this great struggle. Washington State, my, my home state, approved marriage. And just recently, my partner of 28 years and I got married. <laughs> and she's happy and I'm happy. Yet, yet in all this wide and ongoing growth of the LGBT community, amid these winds, another, and more troubling to me, issue has risen up within our organizing. It's the place of what I will call soft religion, uh, non-oppositional -op religion, the place that that holds among us. Uh, many LGBT people find it more difficult to come out as an atheist once they are among so many other activist LGBT people who are welcoming of work with the churches. It's hard to do. Here is where we need your help and guidance, as is happening in this, this wonderful conference. My goodness sakes how to have the conversations that will make the differences. Now you're gonna hear from Greta Christina, Greta Christina, who has this new book, Coming Out Atheist. It's got a wonderful section on just this very topic. I urge you to this book, yes indeed. Goodness sake, what a joy to have someone like that writing. Well, we've come so far, but we've got so much more to do, but in all of this, and more, the LGBT movement fully understands that we're not alone, that there are great allies who are with us because we cannot do this alone, these great struggles. There's much student more to do after marriage, incidentally. And this is the continuing challenge to join with others in a larger project of justice, reason, and equality. And here is where our LGBT and atheist projects and purposes unite. And clearly, clearly, Whenever and wherever a mind's questioning is crushed, there is our common struggle. Whenever and wherever reaction born of fear or dogma weighs down a life, there we are together. And wherever an atheist is turned away, we are there as well. You recall the recent incident with the bank that struck this very organization, American Atheist and its fine president and managing director, that is the very thing that LGBT people face every day in this country and the world. Over half this country you can still be fired if you're LGB or T. Only 44% of this country has any protections of any kind whatsoever for transgender individuals. Now, 
I know, of course, both our groups have faced much, much worse. But while we are not generally burned now, we are most certainly blasted with the heat of rejection and hate. The source of this abuse in almost every single case is religion. The same prejudices and fears that are born in religious dreaming are used against us both. The same well-financed organizations come against us. Oh, I tell you, to quote, a long memory is the most dangerous thing in America. Clara Sparks, the labor movement. These things happen over and over and over again. We, you and I, have been made the refined objects of religious hate. And it is always about fear. In the courtrooms, the boardrooms, the bathrooms, it's always about fear. Because we, no, it's because all along, every single religious attack, every claim, every one of their tricks and charges is because we are what they fear the most. We are minds struggling to think and to be free. We are selves struggling to be whole and to be free. And we will not believe and we will not submit. This is what binds us together. Our religious opposition, through us, especially LGBT, has for too long experienced the unencumbered pleasure of dislike and hate. No longer, no longer, no pass it on. Especially not with American atheists on the job and the LGBT world on the job. Oh, no, no, I'll calm down a little now. But let me offer some additional reasons why I believe our two movements are perfect allies. First, our religious opposition has followed the same dark paths with both of us. They have attempted to roughly and blatantly do away with us. Look at Uganda today, to Russia, many places in this country. Second, our opposition uses fear and false moral outrage to create an anti-LGBT and anti-atheist industry that gives them money and power we don't have. And we are made the cash-producing villains by innumerable religious individuals, organizations, and their widespread, vivid fantasies. <laughs> Next, many of the people who care for justice are drawn away from exploring atheism and into the dream worlds of religion by promises of love and community. Others have discussed this at this conference. It's certainly true for LGBT people. Fourth, having failed in many places to hurt us, religious opposition develops more subtle forms of distinction and destruction, forms that momentarily hide the religious motivation, but not the goal. One of the most blatant right now, and it's in full flower, was beautifully described by J.T. Eberhard last night and by the great Barry Lynn today in, in this morning's sessions. It is the religious attempt to pass something called religious freedom laws. Oh, my goodness. What's, what? They try to be subtle, but they're as subtle as a rock falling on our heads or at any of those people we saw. You know what it is because you heard this morning. So I'll just tell you how it comes again in another format us all the time. Microsoft was going to say yes to transgender inclusion. A preacher shot up and said, no, no, there's this law and this rule and this thing. And so they, we, we they took that back. Well, we went out into the public in Seattle. We had these meetings in public, and we said, no, 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 no. Microsoft said, oh, we, we made a mistake. Oh, no, we'll put this policy in. Oh, across the land, there are groups, public groups in cities uh, that support all manner of things. There's the soccer club, there's this to that, inside city systems, but because city systems say we'll welcome in everyone, so many religious folks would come in and they'd be so blatant, especially the LGBT groups, that pretty soon those groups would disband. Recently, went to a conference, did a little talking, you can see I like to do it, uh, at this conference, and I looked around and said, this is one fine conference center, I must say. However, my flags were up, because there's a little bit of iconography around here and there. So I went, I went through these beautiful trees to the office and I said, look, love the place. I'd like to bring an LGBT conference center here. Can we do that? Oh, no. Because this place turns out to be owned by a religious organization. But they're saying they're open to the public for all these conferences, so I got a little thing going with them now. 
In fact, our civil rights group there, and, yeah, okay, you know, you know how it goes. Well, this phony populism just can't, can't go on. We, okay, so as with LGBT, so with atheists. An owner of a business, if these laws pass, would claim protection and the right to refuse all of us, all of us. So fifth, I'm getting back to my numbers of why we ought to be together. All our projects are deeply involved with the intersectionality, issues of race and class and privilege and international justice. So all of these are issues for all of us, all of us to work on together, bringing our leaderships, our memberships, our attorneys, yeah, our research, our powers together. One last commonality. A bit more distant, a little more esoteric, I don't know, see what you think. Imagine, hanging up here in the air, two big, large presentation boards. On one, it says, who, who I'm attracted to sexually, who, I, who, I'm, who I'm affectionate with, if anybody or anything at all. Over on the other one, it says what I mean when I say the word I. Over here, this one, this is orientation. Over here, this one is gender identity. Now, humans are much more complicated than that. We're a Venn diagram, of course, I know that. But for the purposes of just quick conversation, I want to note that here are two great ancient powers, orientation and identity. And these two powers are older by far than any religion, any creed, or any god idea. For every human is born with these ancient powers, and if you agree, if you agree that no human creature is born with religious dogmas and gods and creeds, then here you've got a marvelous unity among us. Atheism, gender identity, sexual orientation trump all religions, no question. And especially when in the individual person, self-searching about these issues of orientation and gender identity brings on questioning of all things, then this becomes the engine of self-discovery and the rejection of religion's dreams. With all of this in common, I suggest to you that it's only a misunderstanding or unexamined fear that can keep us apart. Here's an example. Here's an example to someone who's just approaching the LGBT world. On first hearing of transgender, some individuals may not know what that is and what it is not. That's a common uh, uh, approach to new knowledge. I know that, I know that. But the free mind will ask and will learn. The fearful mind, however, may run, may run to rejection, to dogma, to control, to fear, to talk of unnaturalness and wrong of danger and difference. Or simply, an unworded, odd fear of body, sexuality, and identity. Now, transgender is not a disease. It's not a mental illness. It's not a sin. It's not a deranged sexuality. It's not pretending or fakery no more than your own identity. Your own identity is a fake. Thus, not at all. It's not danger. Trans people are not predatory. They're not violent. It is usually the trans person who suffers. Many are murdered every year. In fact, fear, ignorance, and transphobia take us down. You know, November 20th of every year is Transgender Day of Remembrance. All over the world. We have these memorials. We read out the names. There were over 70 names last year. 70 names. This is it every year. Such a violence. But here. Transgender is the very core of personal identity, biological to the best of current knowledge, the deepest and most ongoing sense of self, lasting throughout a lifetime. It is one of nature's reality. And consider this statement. From the evidence-based work of international researchers and scientists published in version 7 of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, Standards of Care, a document that's been 40 years in the making, 
the accepted medical and psychological guidelines for transgender health care around the world. Here's the statement. Being transsexual, transgender, or gender nonconforming is a matter of diversity, not pathology. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How long have I waited for that? I joined that organization in 1984. And although trans were around, we're supposed to sit in the back room and just kind of listen to what's going on. Now I've been on the board of directors of that outfit. And it is evidence-based now. That's a long, hard slog. But that's another story altogether. All right. Once all this is known and understood, the concerns fade, the reality wakes, and we can move on together. As individuals, we begin alone, but we win together. And as organizations and movements, it's the same thing. We begin alone, singular, but we win together. This is my, my whole theme, condensed. The LGBT community has learned this. We have it now. Yes, we do. We cannot win alone. We must be part of the whole. My friends, just look at the women's movement, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, schools, and every single one. They've had to learn this. They all teach that to protect ourselves, we must connect ourselves. Yes, in a grand union of intelligence, hope, and action. Now, here are three actions you can take right away. Join or support LGBT groups like the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and they're creating change movement. No, I'm very, very partial to this outfit. I've been on their board for a while. The Creating Change Conference, big event, happens every year, been gone for 26 years. About 3,500, 4,000 queer activists show up, 300 workshops. It's the most amazing smooth fest and adventure you can. OK, I'd invite you to come because there are a lot of those LGBT folks there who are just begging their religions to take them back, or they have the good heart, and the religion is the only place, and so on. A very interesting place for good, honest conversation, just indeed. It's every year. You can check us out, creatingchange.com. Or rather, take a look at the taskforce.com. I don't know my own address there. Second thing you can do, continue an American atheist is a leader here, but continue to welcome LGBT people into this work and teach us, educate us, how atheism, atheism helps free minds and selves, identities, and orientations. Three, oh, you know this is coming. Support the transgender movement. Yes, indeed, through Ingersoll Gender Center, of course, and the many other groups that are out there now, the National Center for Transgender Equality, the Transgender Law Project, the Center for Excellence in Transgender Health, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and many more. Do this, and we will be closer together. Our lives move on, the sun rises, and our time comes round at last. Do this, and we will create and change hearts, minds, worlds. Let your hearts beat for justice, and your mind work for equality. Do this, and win, and win. On some distant, sunlit future morning, you sit in peace and think back on these hard, demanding days. You will remember not just the struggles that you faced, the varied or changing life that you led, the money that your daily efforts made, but the good that you did and the unity that you created. For we are always at work, but we're also at life. And should we, you and I, meet again later on, Tell me stories of your triumphs, great tales of your doings, and we will salute each other. We will cheer for the past and fight for the future, raise glasses together and smile all around, for we will be full in our humanity, engaged in the business of life, worth every heartbeat and every day. Oh, my friends, thank you, thank you. I leave you with Robert Fried Ingersoll's great saying, the time to be happy is now. The place to be happy is here. And the way to be happy is to make others so. You are doing it. I thank you, my friend.